Two-time Olympic gold medalist in bobsleigh, Hall of Famer rugby player, uh, master's at U of T in occupational therapy, an author, and also a motivational speaker, Heather Moyes. Wow, this is such a delight to have you with us it's today. It's great to be here. I know I, I'm missing a whole bunch of other things that are on your resume that are so impressive, but um, but that's that's the short end of it. International Women's Day is all about celebrating women's achievements and accomplishments, and I can't think of anyone better than you who has done just that. Is this what <laughs> mini, mini Heather Moyes, eight-year-old Heather Moyes in Summerside PEI always dreamed of or thought you'd be doing? No, I actually, uh, no. I didn't grow up dreaming about going to the Olympics at all. In fact, I, I did play sports my whole life, um, but just for fun. I grew up in a very academic family, and when you grow up in a pretty small place, Olympians, those are TV people. Like you don't think of those as being everyday normal people like I considered myself to be. So it was just, you know, you, you do the things you're, you're supposed to be doing and go to university, play sports at university, but again, just for fun. It wasn't until I was 27 when I actually um, was recruited to try out for bobsledding, um, when I actually started lifting weights and started um, heading towards the Olympics. And I kind of grasped onto that challenge because the Olympics were only five months away. So it just, I fell in love with this challenge. It had nothing to do with bobsledding because I hadn't even been down a track yet and just kind of had to make this commitment of seeing if I wanted to try and learn a new sport and learn to do it well and learn to do it well in time to compete for my country. Well, so not only did you do it well, but you, so that was just five month period. That was you five months. literally learned the sport of bobsleigh and got into it and then we're at the Olympics. Yes. So what was the driving force for you getting into that? What motivated you to learn this entirely new sport? Absolutely nothing. It was, <laughs> it was, people are often like, well, why did you choose bobsledding? And I think bobsledding chose me. And I know that sounds a bit, you know, cliche, but there was a coach who had tried to recruit me four years earlier for the 2002 Olympics in Salt Lake City. And I said, no, nope, not interested at all. And then four years later, I ran into him again, and he was just really persistent. So finally, I just said, fine, I'll just, I'll do the testing. Um, you know, what's the harm in doing testing? And so I went to the testing camp thinking, there's no way I'm really going to do this. And I ended up breaking one of their testing records. And then it was suddenly a, wait a second, I broke a record amongst all of the people here who have been training for years and who are supposed to be representing our country in five months, I wonder if I can do it. So it really just kind of that taste of it um, just kind of sparked this challenge of seeing if I could, like, can I do it? How far can I go? Was that challenge never existed in your rugby career? Because as I mentioned, Hall of Fame, Hall of Famer rugby, yeah. and you represented Canada on an international stage many times. I, it, it did. It, no, it didn't really because, I mean, I played rugby in high school and I absolutely loved it. And then I played for a couple of years at university. And again, I just played because I loved it. But I didn't actually know that we had a national women's rugby team. So I wasn't playing or training to try and achieve another level. I was just playing because I loved the sport. And I mean, rugby wasn't in the Olympics until our just last summer Olympics. So, I mean, even when I played for the national team, ended up playing for the national team for years, it still wasn't in the Olympics. So it was, for me, I, I was long listed for this national team after just playing in a tournament. And when they said, you've been named to the long list, I was like, what long list? And they're like, the national women's rugby team. And I was like, we have a, whoa, we have a national women's rugby team? Like that was my reaction. So I think it's been really neat because you kind of see how far you can go just for the pure love of, of doing something and for the pure love of the sport. And then add a little bit of training onto that and, and you can take things a little bit further. How modest, a little bit of training. <laughs> uh, but you mentioned rugby and bobsledding and those are not traditionally, at least years ago when you were getting into the mainstream sports for females. So. Was there something that attracted you to them? You said you grew up playing rugby, so why, why I did. rugby? Uh, rugby, in, like growing up in PEI, it's interesting because I think what we see as being traditionally male or female roles, even if you're talking about in the household, right? Stay-at-home moms versus stay-at-home dads, or you know, who's the breadwinner of the family? Like All of those roles are now kind of shifting and changing and evolving. Um, but when we were growing up, you would think back then that rugby wasn't you know, a sport for girls. In my hometown, in my province of PEI, there was men's and women's soccer, there was men's and women's basketball, there was men's and women's rugby. Like, I didn't think of it any other way except that I was just trying out for another sport. So, I mean, at the time, 
hockey for girls was just kind of getting started. So that wasn't really on the plate, like on the table for me, but it wasn't a mat. It didn't matter because I was playing all these other sports. And, and so some sports I grew up thinking, oh, well, that's more traditionally for men and traditionally for women. Um, but rugby wasn't one of them. Rugby was men's tryouts, women's tryouts. Here we go. Let's start the season. And it was probably one of the biggest tryouts at our school because that was the only sport really that was taking part in the spring. So every time people were split up because multiple sports were happening in the fall or in the winter, everyone was trying out for rugby. If you were an athlete, you were, it, you were there. You were at the tryouts. It was pretty fun. Because those two sports are known for its power, strength, which you have a lot of. You're naturally muscular. You're an, obviously yeah. a natural athlete. Are those attributes you kind of shied away from growing up? And you kind of, well, tried to, I don't know, play it down? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I didn't, again, when I was growing up, it wasn't, uh, CrossFit wasn't a thing, right? Like CrossFit has just lit this world on fire over the last number of years. But when I was growing up, it wasn't a thing. And even going to the gym, like gym, being fit and wasn't trendy. And it wasn't the, the in thing to go to the gym. The only people who went to the gym were not, it wasn't even guys. It would have been specifically football players or people who, you know, were kind of labeled the meat, you know, the gym rats, the meatheads. And it wasn't, it was, I mean, it's terrible to say, but those were the only people in the gym. Even athletes, even like intense athletes in high school or whatever weren't spending that extra time in the gym. They were just going to practices and, and playing their sports. So it really wasn't a thing. And for a girl, a young girl who is genetically very muscular anyway, you know, hand-me-down gifts from my parents, um, I was very self-conscious about my body. And even when I went to university, it was, <clears throat> I mean, we were handed extra lifting programs to go and lift on the side of the training we did as a team. And I would just go and put those in the recycling bin and, you know, carry on with just the training with the team and ignore all the weightlifting. And nobody ever questioned whether I was doing them or not because by looking at me, they just assumed I was lifting weights already. So I kind of got away with um, not doing that and not training anything extra because I was just, I was really concerned about you know, if I already look like I'm lifting weights now, what would I look like if I did lift weights? And so there was that... I mean, that came from a place of ignorance, too, in terms of lifting weights and what, how that changes your body, of course. And now we are so much more educated in, in, in training and in fitness and, in, and also our perceptions of what we feel of as, as, as attractive and how we, you know, we perceive ourselves versus what society sees as being beautiful. All that stuff has shifted and changed and morphed, and, and it's, all, it's all growing and evolving, and it will forever. Um, and so it's just where I was in my life. And I mean, probably if I were growing up now, I would be heading to, you know, American Ninja Warrior or CrossFit something or whatever. Like things would be different with different choices because of different availability of, of things. But for sure, I definitely downplayed things growing up. Um, when you're also in a small town, you don't necessarily want to be standing out or making it seem like you're trying to be better than other people. So you kind of suppress those things or you do just enough to make sure that the team is doing well because you're on the team and you want to do well you're I was competitive but you don't want to go that extra mile and make it seem as though you think you're better than other people or that you're also trying to be the coach's pet or the you know it was it's it was tricky to manage that stuff and now I'm in a position where I'm trying to empower people and it's it's more about owning your story and breaking free of the you know, those naysayers and those people in communities that drag you down just because they don't have the courage for themselves to go and pursue their visions and they, so they try and stop other people. So it's, it's really been an interesting journey for me. Were there, were there naysayers along the road, along the way in, mm -hmm. in any of your career choices or, or life choices and what you did with sports, whether it was growing up or maybe in your 20s or, or now? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a difference. I think there's, uh, in my book I actually talk about the energy takers um, in our lives. And I kind of categorize them into two different types. They're the lobsters and then there are the naysayers. So the naysayers are the ones who just really have a, a negative attitude. They see the glass half empty people. They point out the negatives and the, you know, what's gonna go wrong in every scenario. Uh, and then you have the lobsters who are not necessarily pointing out the negatives, but they'll just say these comments to drag people down, to make people 
think that their dreams are stupid or dumb or, you know, it's that kind of scenario where people are trying to break free and do something positive with their lives. But these people have spent a lifetime convincing themselves that they can't. So they don't want, they only want to see other people succeed to a point and then they want to kind of drag them back down just like a lobster would in there. Yeah. I love, in of course, tank. an East Coast girl is talking about a yeah. lobster. Some people call them crabs in a bucket, like the crabs, <laughs> how they pull each other down. But um, anyway, it's been, it's been really interesting. But for me, there was, uh, when I was in high school, um, I remember we were waiting for the bell to ring to leave for recess or at the end of the day. And there was a girl, a friend of mine, and she said, talked to someone else and said, look at that girl over there. She thinks she's so much better than everyone else. And it, she was referring to a girl in the corner who was minding her own business and just talking to a friend and showing her a dance move or something. And I just remember internalizing right at that moment, I don't want anyone to ever think that I think I'm better than they are. So it was this instant suppression. Now, I didn't even realize that until doing a workshop a few years ago. And we were talking about the things that hold you back from taking your business to the next level and why are we holding ourselves back even though we may have so much potential and What's keeping us there? And so doing a lot of this work, I realized that comment had stuck with me for all these years. And so it kind of infiltrates in a lot of different places in your life, not just, it doesn't stay with you just for that moment. And e Even though you were on top of the podium twice on a world stage. Yeah, I know. It took, hmm. it took the taste of that and turning it into a challenge. Not, it wasn't about proving that I was better than anyone. It was about just challenging myself to see how far I could go. And so it was a different mindset, but then transfer it over to my business. It was a, it's almost like the fee for service or how do you value yourself or how do you take your, your um, business to the next level and all of these different things and what's holding you back from believing that you're capable of taking things to the next level. And a lot of that stuff is, well, I just, I'm from a small town and I love where I'm from and I love my relationship with people on PEI and my fellow Canadians and I don't want anyone to ever think that I think I'm better than they are because I truly don't. But that doesn't mean that we can't do really great things and using what we've accomplished to lift others up. And so there's, it needed a mindset shift for myself. And that all came from actually acknowledging where that came from, like what that was rooted in. So it's really interesting, all of those things. And then, I mean, the naysayers, of course there were naysayers. That's, you know, sometimes it's even teammates who go into a game and you hear them saying, oh, and you, you know that they believe you're not going to win that game. And it's just like, oh, great. Well, <laughs> guess we've already lost since you don't even believe that we're going to, that it's possible. Um, also, I mean, media, mm -hmm. right? You're going into, can Heather really recover from surgery in time to get back on the national team, let alone win another gold medal? Or after our very first day of competition in Sochi, we were losing by a significant amount. And um, there was an article written that night after our first day of competition, and the title was, um, here's why the U.S. women's bobsled team has basically already won gold. And it's just like, oh, all right then. You know, but I mean, if we had read that and absorbed that and taken that in, those are often the times where people hear people's comments and they're like, no, you're right, it's probably unlikely. But when I'm talking to people, that's what I want people to realize. Unlikely, highly unlikely, is not the same thing as impossible. So just because something's unlikely and the odds are stacked against you, they were able to create that deficit on day one, so why can't we create that deficit on day two? And so it's, it's really just, yeah, I love what I do now. I love what I do. I was going to say, you're motivating me yeah. already. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yes, you have transitioned so easily yeah. because it's come naturally and you've learned so much um, throughout through sports, but also, you know, your undergrad at Waterloo and your master's. Yeah. And you've taken every part and now using it to help others. It's been really great. I mean, that master's degree um, in occupational therapy, it was, it has academically trained me to help people shift their perspective to see the possibilities that still exist within their circumstance, uh, which in most of my placements in that, in that degree was with, in neuro. So I did a lot of neurosurgery. I was working with people post-stroke or post-traumatic brain injury. And sometimes it really just came down to perspective and mindset. And it may not be that you're going to be able to do exactly what you want the same way you've always done it. But do you want to do it the same way and get a different result? Or do you want to go a different way to get that same result? So it's, it's a, it's an interesting concept, but to be able to combine that training um, with my personal experiences, it's been a, it's been a huge blessing for me, mm -hmm. for sure.
Growing up, you had an older sister who you looked up to. She was heavily involved in sports, like your younger brother as well. And then you went from from being part of a team with so many strong women, I'm sure very opinionated, and then <laughs> smaller team of women. So what did you learn from the women along, along the route? Yeah, my sister was a huge influence on me, partly just because she was three years older and I wanted to keep up. So if you wanted to hang out with your sister, you know, you kind of push the envelope and you try and, you know, make that happen so you can hang out with her and her friends. Um, my mother was a massive influence just in terms of how she, how she deals with people. I mean, you could be a complete stranger and you'll sit on a bench beside my mother and realize that you've just told her stuff you've never told anyone in your life. And then you'll be like, sir, what's your name again? <laughs> like, I've just told you my life story. She is that kind of that open heart, trusting person. And if I even have a like a fraction of that gift, then I feel really blessed. Um, and then in working with teams, you work with very different types of people. And um, sometimes when you're working with those people, you realize the type of people you admire and the kind of uh, characteristics that you want to adopt and the kind of people you want to become. And you also work, it's the same as in any industry or business, you also end up meeting people and working with people who you um, realize that those are people, uh, they've maybe come into your life for a reason, and that reason might just be to, tell, to show you the kind of person you don't ever want to become, and the characteristics you don't ever want to adopt, um, and the values you hold dear versus the ones that, that you don't necessarily respect. And it's been a huge learning curve. Um, I think when you work with big groups of people and, and small groups of people, um, to be successful, it's not only about self-awareness and figuring out what uh, what you need to be successful on that team, but it's also knowing what the overall goal is for everybody and knowing sometimes what is important and what is essential for your teammates to be successful and what they need from you. And sometimes it's sacrificing a little bit of what you might need in order to strengthen what someone else needs to make a good balance and to be successful as a team. So a lot of that is not just self-awareness, it's kind of that overall awareness of, of what is going to help the team. And now, as you are touring and speaking in front of many, I know Canadian Armed Forces on International Women's yes. Day, um, but also to younger, uh, younger audience, uh, girls and boys. But do you hear something, uh, a common comment or question that young girls will ask you? Is there something that sticks out that you've heard from, from them? I think a lot of girls, it depends on the group. Mm -hmm. um, some girls are just you know, will come up after and say, thank you for, you know, showing that it's, it's okay to be strong and muscular and athletic. Um, and, and other people, which I find a little bit strange because in this day and age, that kind of is a big momentum shift. Um, and other, for you, the younger ones, a lot of them are asking questions like, how did you have the courage to? And it's how did you have the courage? Sometimes it's to leave your hometown or to make the decision to do something or to go for it. And, you know, I get questions. I've gotten questions a couple of times from both girls and boys just about decision making. And how do you decide? Like for some, there was a young boy on our Canadian field, on the junior Canadian field hockey team. And his question for me was, well, he said that he'd always wanted to work in, um, in his home, like his ancestral home country of India. Um, but he was scared of taking a year away from being in Canada to, to train with the team. And I get the same questions from girls. And it's the, the, the worry. And part of what I feel lucky about is that because I joined the team, I joined training and I joined the bobsled team when I was 27, um, I can very easily say, you need to live your life and do the things that you love, but you need to weigh the pros and cons, and mostly the cons, of whatever scenario you're going to do and what you can live with based on worst case scenario in both in both circumstances because if you don't go and do the things that your heart is set on doing because you're set on making this team well what if you don't make the team what if you get injured two weeks out and are you going to think that the four years was a waste or were you dealing with this four-year cycle because you were in this in the moment doing exactly what you wanted to do and that didn't matter. Like, yeah, disappointment, but you wouldn't have changed anything. Um, or you could have someone like me come in last minute and potentially take your spot. If it's about, 
you know, if someone is better than you, then, then you might lose it. Again, that same question, are you going to wish that you had gone and done that? Or are you gonna be very happy with the fact that you wouldn't have changed anything anyway? So I think a lot of it is just decision making. And that's the same thing as adults. I mean, I get those questions too, because people are, we're so inundated and bombarded with the opinions and values and expectations of everyone around us, women especially. Mm -hmm. I think we have a more of a guilty feel, a guilty conscience, soul, a conscience, yes, whatever, yes. that makes us want to make other people happy. And so because there's so much noise and we're trying to satisfy so many expectations of other people, we often lose sight of what our legitimate priorities are, like what are our values, and often if we, but we don't have time. Mm -hmm. we, we just live such busy lives that we just kind of let things run, whereas if we actually took the time to disconnect and like really physically disconnect from vibrating watches and pockets and stuff, then it would give us the time to actually figure out what is important to us, which would help make all our decision making a lot easier when I've, faced with requests coming in from everywhere. Yes, it's hard. Yeah. I have to learn to say no. I think all of us do. Has there been a dis big decision recently um, for you that you've had to make where you've weighed the pros and cons and decided, you know, this is it? Maybe when it comes to bobsleigh, you were at the Olympics just a year ago. Yeah. Oh, my. Yeah. Just, oh, my gosh. Just a year ago. Just a year ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, a year ago, we would have just been coming home. Uh, it that was a big decision for me, like huge. Um, I mean, my former teammate with whom I'd won gold in both Vancouver and Sochi, she had asked me if I would go back in like the March before, so a year before Pyeongchang, and I said no. I loved my business. I loved empowering other people. I'd moved on. Like now it wasn't about me being more successful. It was about helping other people, and I loved that. Um, and then the coaches asked me in the spring, and I said no. No, I'm good. Thanks. I'm good. And then I got an Instagram message from this up and coming driver, Alicia Risling, who had to introduce herself because we'd never met before. So she introduced herself and, you know, she she said that um, she introduced herself and then she said there's a lack of leadership in the program. That besides my former teammate who had to focus on her own success, there was nobody else in the women's program who had actually been to an Olympic Games before. And she said based on what her coaches and her trainers had said, she said it's apparently the most stressful year ever of the of the quad. It's just there are stresses and pressures that you you can't foresee. You can't you just can't imagine. And so she was really asking me for my experience of having successfully managed high pressure pressure situations and kind of the ins and outs of an Olympic season. And I mean, for someone who had written a book about shifting your perspective to achieve, you know, to see the possibilities, and I was pretty I was shocked to have had my own perspective shifted but uh, she just made me think about it in a whole different way like it wasn't just about the push and the, and just trying to win for the sake of winning it was about leadership and about impact and so the more I thought about it the more I realized that although I wasn't motivated by the idea of going back to try and win a third Olympic medal I was motivated by the idea of helping someone get to the Olympics and potentially win their first. And it just became a whole mind shift for me. And I was like, oh my God, am I really thinking about this? And the entire month of August was spent, and this is only six months out. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I had to get on the phone with her. And I said, you do know that I haven't trained since Sochi. Like that's three and a half years I haven't trained. And I've had a second hip surgery within that three and a half years that I rehabbed, unfortunately, like a normal person and not like an athlete who's, you know, expecting to put crazy amounts of force through her hip. And so I was just like, I also just turned 39. So just throwing it out there, not sure what's going to happen. And she said, okay, we'll just do some stuff and let me know how it feels. And I did one warm up, like a dynamic warm up, like stretching. I was sore for three days. And I was like, I don't know what's going to happen right now. And it was just this entire month of being like, and what if? What if I go back? And what if I don't? And, and I knew that some people wouldn't like the idea of me going back and not being with my former teammate because that's how they envisioned us competing, was just always as a team. And for me, it was just more important to invest in the next generation and, and support younger athletes. And my heart wasn't in winning just for the sake of winning. It was still in like challenging myself and seeing what I could do, but more so on the side of helping someone else. And also standing up for the messaging of authentic decision making. You know, just because other people expect you to or just because that's how society defines success, fulfillment is the feeling of success and not necessarily the outward success as defined by others. And so I really want people to start 
looking at decision making in terms of how they're going to feel fulfilled, how they're going to feel successful instead of just being outwardly acknowledged as being successful. I mean, I know a high-powered attorney here in Toronto who, you know, has gotten awards and is right at the top and she, she hates her job. Like, she realized that she got there because she was, you know, earning these, you know, bonuses and, and then she'd get promoted and then she'd earn a, an award and she was excellent at what she did. But just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. And so part of my decision, and staying firm with my decision of not just shifting over sleds to because it was the best chance of winning a medal um, is partly just to empower people by knowing it's okay to make decisions that are right for you and standing up for your own values and and stuff. So it was it was it was pretty great. Like the, it was really fun. Yeah. So the message is here: if you want Heather to be uh, part of your bobsled team, <laughs> Instagram DM her and she'll check it in twenty twenty in twenty twenty one. Wait, wait a couple years to do that. Uh, I'll be forty. <laughs> Two then, hey, three then, nothing but a which number. means you I might that. need more than six months. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I know Doug McLean, also of yes. Summerside PEI. You talk yeah. about you talked earlier about uh, from a small town, mm -hmm. not having a lot of, I don't know uh, what words do you use, but he definitely has a lot of confidence over on Hockey yes. Central, doesn't he? <laughs> uh, and and Ken Reed Attaboy, is a huge Doug. fan as well, and uh, and so am I. So thank you so much for joining us, Heather. Thank it's been you a real for pleasure. Having me.